what is it like to obtain this kind of fame later in life? Do you find that you approach it with more appreciation than some others? Or perhaps do you look at it a bit more pragmatically and less idealistic than you might have if you had acquired this kind of notoriety in your 20s? I say probably the, the latter of the two. I, I'm more pragmatic about it. Um, when you interview somebody that you have been a fan of, whether it's Sting or Brian May, now being almost 62, it's, it's, it's different um, than if I were 25 and meeting the people. Um, you just have a, a different perspective on life, I think, being, being older. So it's, uh, I'm, but of course, I'm incredibly appreciative. Yeah. And I, my observation, and I don't think it's an especially deep one, but what you've done prior to this launch kind of set you up for this because you are, at, to me, at base an educator. Yeah. I always think of myself as, as a music teacher. And, and I think that my, my YouTube channel is also a music appreciation channel uh, as much as anything because uh, I, I do do both teaching and the appreciation comes in the form of song breakdowns or interviews with people or you know, um, talking about different genres of music, music history, things like that. Absolutely. And this question isn't going to sound like it, but it's linked to that kind of teaching uh, angle. You've worked with Gibson to create this Les Paul special uh, double cut guitar, and it was so popular. I believe they recently released a second version with a, a different finish to it. And from what I read, you agreed to do that only if the royalties went to help getting instruments into the hands of kids. Yeah, one of the things, I've never done any, um, any collaborations with any companies. I don't do any sponsored videos. But when Gibson approached me about this, I said, I would love to do it as long as all the, my proceeds would go to Save the Music, which is the charity that Gibson has partnered with for many years. And it uh, gets instruments to kids in public schools, which I think is an incredibly important thing. And me being from Fairport, where it has an incredibly good music program, always has since uh, I started playing the cello in 1969 uh, as part of the Fairport public school system. I think that public, uh, public music education is incredibly important. So that's something that I want to support. And you note the musical background that you had here. You picked it up at, at home, perhaps in school. If you could kind of talk about the inspiration and the atmosphere that I suppose moved music into your life. Well, music was really important in my family. My mom, two of her sisters were music teachers. One of her brothers was a, uh, was a bass player. Her dad was a guitar player, amateur guitar player. My dad was a huge music listener. I have six siblings. And I also was fortunate enough not only to, to be in the music program, the orchestra at Fairport High School, but I took lessons at a place. I started at this place, T. Rizzo Music, over in Northfield Commons in Pitts, Pittsford. Uh, that is now Northfield Music that my dear friend Joe Chapone still owns. And I had a great education there with these incredible teachers learning guitar when I was in high school. And that was also, I mean, Rochester has the best players, always has, and has incredible music education. And it's just such a part of the culture in that part of the country. I mean, just Rochester is a really unique place. And I tell people I could never have done what I do on YouTube if I wasn't for, from Rochester. Really, why is that? Well, I think that beyond the um, beyond the, all the access to music education there, I think that people from Rochester, this is a generalization, but have a way of talking to people that um, I think people from all over the world can relate to, it seems to be. Because I, I don't think of myself as being any different than any of my siblings or any of my friends that I grew up with, at least the way that I relate to people. To me, it's a very Rochester way of speaking so um it, and it and it you know from the success of my music of my youtube channel it seems that people uh can identify with 
I guess, the way that people speak that are from Rochester. <laughs> I'm going to take that compliment on behalf of Rochester. There you uh, go. You? <laughs> and I, I think you've said at the start of some interviews, uh, this isn't going to be a traditional interview. This is going to be more like a conversation. And I think that uh, I do see that around town. There, there usually isn't that formality. It's more just an interest, and that comes out in the questions. So I think that's uh, a pretty good insight on your part. And when you were growing up, you know, you already had the success of Steve Gadd, Tony Levin, the Mangione brothers. I mean, did these folks influence you, inspire you? Did you kind of know they were out there in your community? So when I was in third grade, I had a public school teacher and just general music teacher named Miss Malm. And she was friends with Chuck Mangione and he came to our third grade class and he played for the third graders. This was in, <laughs> oh geez. So uh, probably 1971, 1971. I was at Northside School in, uh, in Fairport and Chuck came and talked to the third graders and played for us. And I never forget that. Uh, Tony Levin, massive fan. I've interviewed Steve Gadd. <laughs> I, I, I've known about them since forever. When I was growing up, I knew of them and followed their careers. And, uh, and like I said, I've been fortunate enough to interview uh, uh, some of them. Hope to interview Chuck at some point here in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And now you're going to be joining them in the Rochester Music Hall of Fame. Your thoughts on that? Uh, it's really, it's a huge honor and, and incredibly exciting. And um, it's exciting, I think, for my family as well. I'll be, I'll be able to see them when I come up. And um, it's, it's a, a, a great group of people to be a part of. Yeah. <clears throat> and kind of going to your, to your roots as well, but maybe outside of Rochester, you got your master's in jazz guitar. You taught at Ithaca College. And you were producing music all the while. How did you balance all of this? Did you have to balance all of it to make a living? I, I pretty much went from one thing to the other. So I taught at Ithaca College for five years. Then I went into, uh, into playing in, in bands for the, probably from the time I was 30 to 35, I got a record deal for a couple of years. And then I started producing full time in 1999 until I started my YouTube channel at the young age of 54 back in 2016. <laughs> Did you foresee what YouTube was going to become at that point? No, I had no idea. All I knew was uh, I watched some YouTube channels. I mean, I pretty much used my YouTube channel to share videos of my kids with my mom because that was the easiest way to do it when YouTube <laughs> started back in 2006. One of my brothers said, I said, how can I send stuff to mom? He said, up, upload it to this thing called YouTube and then you can share a link with her. It's like, YouTube, where's that? Just look it up, just type it in youtube.com. Okay, great, and I did that. So that's pretty much what I used YouTube for until I started my channel. You know, I read a lot of biographies of musicians and there's always kind of that moment where things break their way. I think yours is very original. I don't think I've heard it just like that before. And speaking <laughs> of, you did it with your son, if I'm not mistaken, when he was seven years old, he had perfect pitch. You had a match notes and it provided the lightning that sparked all of this. So I was just wondering now that we're, boy, at 20, 20 years, something like that, uh, from there, 25, how is, or what is it, 15, 20 years, how's he doing? Okay, so so I actually had the thing was on Facebook was the uh, had this viral video with him and that was in 2015 and he was eight then I think he was yeah he was eight okay so he's he's 16 now and uh, he's he plays guitar and still has the most amazing ear and uh, I showed him I I started um, about six months ago he started playing guitar he's left handed too. So I said, he said, came down to the studio, he said, show me some chords. So I showed him a couple chords. And the next day he said, show me a couple other things. And then the third day he said, I learned Stairway to Heaven. I was like, what? <laughs> what? I, you learned Stairway to Heaven? You've been playing guitar for three days. So uh, he's, uh, he's a pretty fast study. Yeah, that's great. Well, boy, I, usually I get the dates wrong in reverse, uh, but it, only uh, nine years. Uh, such a, a flurry of activity for you. When it comes to the videos that you've made, do you have a favorite one that you look at and you're like, I'm really proud of that one? Yes. I did a, a video. When people ask me this, there's one video that pops into my mind and it was a, I did a remake of Stairway to Heaven. I took the solo 
of Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin, and I took Jimmy Page's solo, and I had three different people, myself, I have a friend, Phil X, that plays the Bon Jovi, and then uh, Eric Johnson, who's a fantastic guitar player. And I had a thing where, what if someone else played the guitar solo to uh, Stairway to Heaven? I imitated what I thought Peter Frampton would have played, and my friend Phil X imitated Eddie Van Halen, and Eric Johnson did his own solo. So I recreated the track, playing all the instruments with, uh, with a friend of mine, and then we each did our guitar solos. And that, that to me is my favorite video. I thought it was a, a really interesting and, um, and that's one that, I, uh, that I'm really proud of. All right, well, right after this interview, I'm gonna hustle off and listen to that, I promise you. <laughs> it, you know what I found interesting too is when I was reading about your work, I learned that you've testified before some U.S. Senate committees about big issues like copyright and artificial intelligence. What inspired you to venture outside the studio, if you will, and take on these type of issues in such a public way? Well, I've made a lot of videos about content ID claims and blocking of videos on YouTube, things that, that uh, my videos would be almost all my videos would be fair use when I do a song breakdown because it involves teaching and, and, uh, and so I was really, I made videos about that topic many times. So I got asked to testify about that back in 2020 to the judiciary committee. And then I did an AI, uh, this was another Senate committee that I went to DC. It's probably about five months ago or so. And I testified along with 18 other people from all different companies. There was a, a Senate hearing, it was a closed door hearing on AI because I've made videos on AI and what I think the uh, uh, benefits of it will be and what the detriments will be and how it needs to be, uh, or my thoughts on the regulation that they're thinking about proposing right now, even though they haven't really done anything as of yet, but they, this was the seventh of nine closed door meetings they were having on it. And it was absolutely fascinating. So whatever I can add to the conversation when I got invited, I said, absolutely, I'd love to come and help in any way I can. Wow, and what is what are the potential benefits and detriments to AI in the music industry right now? Well, some of the benefits, um, one of them are on display in the new Beatles songs that they did, that they did uh, where you can use AI to separate things like uh, the, the John Lennon sang and played piano and did a demo of this song. And you can separate the voice from the piano, which you never could do before without any artifacts. You can't hear any of the piano in his voice. You can't hear any of his voice in the piano. You can do things like that. That's a really great thing. What are the bad things that people, companies, whether it's Spotify, Apple Music, uh, TikTok, all these companies, all the, the Warner Music, uh, UMG, which is Universal Music Group, uh, Sony, are going to have all their own AI generated music. Those are the downsides of it. You know, who's going to hold the copyright on it? Who, what are the models that those songs are gonna be trained on? I believe in the future, there's gonna be, you'll go to Apple Music or Spotify and you'll see the Beatles and then the Beatles AI and Led Zeppelin and Led Zeppelin AI. And there will be things that people like that are the AI versions that are created by computers, by artificial intelligence that people will enjoy as much as the other artists. And there will be people 20 years from now, Oh, I, I much prefer the Rolling Stones AI to the Rolling Stones. I, I, that's just going to be a thing. Wow. That's hard to imagine. It is hard to imagine, but you know, hmm. the internet was hard to imagine. Yeah, true. Um, very true. And you do a lot with the top 10. You're, you're usually talking about the state of, of music uh, in the present. What do you think uh, outside of AI, just general state of music right now? What's your take? What's it? There's some interesting trends happening. I did a video recently where I, where um, country music and rock music have taken a turn, a really upturn, and hip hop has gone down in popularity over the last four years or so. 
which I thought was kind of interesting. And I noticed on some of the uh, Spotify countdowns that I do, I do one every four months. I, I take the top 10 songs in the pop charts. I play part of them and I talk about them. And I've noticed that there's a lot more country songs on there, more rock songs, more, more songs with organic instruments like guitar, less auto-tune, less uh, programmed beats or beats that are uh, have a particular sound to them. Uh, so there's definitely a change happening in popular music. And um, I don't know if it's a trend. We'll see what happens. You know, usually it takes a couple of years to, to, to see these things through. So, but there are some trends that are happening that are, that are different that I think are really positive. You, you've interviewed a few people uh, who have said stuff like this, and I have too. Steve Gadd is one of them. When um, I asked him about his riff, uh, for the Paul Simon song, um, oh, I'm gonna, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. Thank you very much. You know, yeah. and it's so funny, they, they, try, they make it seem so simple, and I, don't, I think they do it genuinely. They're like, oh, well, I was, you know, in his case, I was you know, just tapping out something kind of mixed from my military days, and it, you know, Paul walked past and said he liked it. And they, or someone says, oh, if you, if you find the common tones and the D and this and that. But then... <laughs> But then the magic happens, and I, I have trouble understanding that bridge between the, the simple musicality of it and where they find the magic. I don't know if you can offer anything to help me understand that or other people who kind of just sit in amazement at this stuff. Well, I sit in amazement with it, and uh, when I interviewed Steve Lukather, who's uh, speaking of common tones, he played, uh, he was talking about the Michael Jackson song, Human Nature. And he was, he said, oh, I'm just looking for the common tones, the co co uh, notes that are common from chord to chord in that song. And he came up with this muted guitar part that he plays and then he mimics the melody during the chorus part. And it's a brilliant part and it really makes the song. And he can just come up with these things right off the top of his head without even thinking about it <laughs> and play it perfectly in one take. And those kind of people just, it's amazing to me or Steve Gadd comes up with these drum beats. Not only does he come up with the drum beats, but he plays them perfectly in one take. Yeah. But, and then they just, they look at you as an interview and they're like, don't you get it? This is so easy. I'm like, I don't get it. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's easy for them. It's, it's fascinating to, to uh, certain people are able to, to focus and focus their creativity and be, in the moment and really um, play these flawless performances under pressure with a producer and the artist listening. But that's why they are session musicians, studio yeah. musicians, where they get these gigs is because they're able to do that. 100%. Do you find that you say you're a fan and all that, but at this point you have so much talent behind you, so much understanding of music, do you have trouble enjoying music as you did as a teenager or as I do now, not having your background? I have no trouble. As a matter of fact, I always tell people, I never even think about what the structure of a song is, what the chords are, anything, unless I'm gonna make a video about it or someone asks me. And then I kind of turn that part of my brain on mm -hmm. and then I can tell you what the chords are, what the melody is and all that. But other than that, I just listen to it as a fan and never it never even occurs to me yeah you're lucky i can't watch newscasts like that anymore so uh <laughs> i have to ask you the stock uh, question which you get all the time but uh, i'm interested in it out of you've interviewed so many amazing musicians i mean brian may sting i mean you just go down the list any of them that you would say well that was my favorite interview perhaps because their talent even their quirkiness their personality Oh, brother. I, it's, it's really tough to, I, I couldn't single anyone out. they they're all so different. They're, they're, um, they're all so fascinating. I learned different things from dirt, from different uh, artists that I've interviewed. Um, it's uh, the thing for me is that every question I've wanted to ask the people that I've, that I've been fans of for so long, whether it's Michael McDonald or who I just interviewed recently, or George Benson, I just interviewed recently. I haven't even put out that video yet. And I think back to being a kid, listening to them, and here I am, and I can ask them anything I want. Mm -hmm. And um, that's nothing more fun than that. I saw the Michael McDonald interview. I was about to click on it. I saw it was an hour, 44 minutes. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do that <laughs> one later. 
Um, <laughs> my last question for you is kind of selfish, uh, but I, I don't care. Um, I have a 12 year old who's learning guitar. What's your message to, to kids like him who are getting into it? They might not fully understand or appreciate what music is when it comes to you know what it can mean to your life. What, what's your message to the kids who might be getting an instrument from your own work through Gibson? Um, you know what 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 do you tell them? Uh, well, I tell them that. To get good on anything, you need to practice. I say instruments don't play themselves. <laughs> you actually have to sit there and go through. There's, there's a discipline that goes along with learning a musical instrument, but it's one of the most rewarding things you can do for yourself, and especially later on in your life. Now, kids don't, don't understand that, but if you stick with something like guitar, even if it's, if it's as, a, at a, as a hobby, Later on in life, it's just so fun. I see my younger brother John plays in a band in uh, in, in in Rochester called Northside Johnny, a cover band. They do '70s music, and he has so much fun. Even though this is something he does in his in his free time or his part time, as all the musicians in his band do, and it's just incredibly rewarding. Absolutely. I, I... For what it's worth, I remember talking to a CEO one time who plays guitar in his office every once in a while, and he said, the reason I do it is because when you play guitar, you can't, you, for him at least, he can't think of anything else. And right. it's just, it's a beautiful relief, and I find that as well. So, uh, Anything else, Rick, that I might have missed that you want to add? No, it's, it's, uh, I'm just really honored to be asked to be in the uh, Rochester Music Hall of Fame. It's, it's um it's it's really exciting, and I look forward to the uh, to coming up, to coming up to visit my family and uh, and attending the ceremony. Yeah, we look forward to having you here. Congratulations! Thank you so much. Appreciate it.